Our keynote, Dr. Elizabeth Schuster Fiorenza, is Krister Stendhal Professor of Divinity at Harvard University Divinity School. She is an internationally known scholar, lecturer, and teacher who combines her scholarly work on biblical interpretation with her pioneering research in feminist theology, rhetoric, and hermeneutics. And as a former student, I'm just absolutely privileged to have you here tonight. Thanks so much for coming. The list of her publications, both in English and German, is extensive. They include In Memory of Her, Bread Not Stone, Jesus, Miriam's Child, Sophia's Prophet, Sharing Her Word, Jesus and the Politics of Interpretation, and Wisdom's Ways. Her latest book is The Power of the Word, Scripture, and the Rhetoric of Empire. Dr. Shusa Fiorenza was the first woman scholar to serve as president of the Society of Biblical Literature, the nation's oldest and largest biblical society. She also holds several honorary doctorates from American colleges and divinity schools and European universities. Professor Schuster Fiorenza's active leadership in the academy and her involvement in work connected with women in academy, church, ministry, and theology is extensive. Together with Judith Plaskow, she has co-founded and still co-edits the Journal of Feminist Studies in Religion. She also has initiated and been the co-editor of the issue of feminist theology of the International Roman Catholic Journal, Concilium. Professor Schuster Fiorenza has been the first co-chair of the AAR, SBL, Women's Caucus, and has served on numerous task forces on women in church and ministry. In 1987, U.S. Catholic Magazine chose her as Catholic of the Year. The Women's Ordination Conference has recognized her involvement in the women's movement in the churches with its first service award. Responding to Dr. Schuster Fiorenza this evening is Dr. Lisa Sol Cahill, who holds the J. Donald Monin S.J. Chair at the BC Theology Department. Lisa, we're thrilled to have you here this evening. Dr. Cahill's publications include Sexuality in the U.S. Catholic Church, Crisis and Renewal, Sex, Gender, and Christian Ethics, Family, a Christian Social Perspective, Bioethics and the Common Good, and Theological Bioethics, Participation, Justice, and Change, most recently. Dr. Cahill holds eight honorary doctorate degrees. She is past president of the Catholic Theological Society of America, past president of the Society of Christian Ethics, and serves on the Catholic Common Ground Initiative Steering Committee. So quite a long list and not complete for either, uh, but just in terms of time, um, those are just some of the things I wanted to be sure to highlight. So we'll have the opportunity to hear from our speakers, and then we'll allow some time for conversation at our tables. And after that, we'll come back together and offer a little bit of time for some comments and questions. And then at the end, we'll invite you all to join us for a reception here in this room and the two adjacent spaces um, to which all are welcome. And I would be remiss in my duties if I did not also mention, and I'll mention it again before we close this evening, there's a program evaluation um, for each person on your table. And at the end of the night, if you could fill that out and return it to us by leaving it on your table or at the uh, registration table, that would be very helpful. So thank you and welcome. Good evening. First of all, I would like to thank Sheila McMahon, the director of Boston College Women's Resource Center, for inviting me to be a keynote speaker in the series on Encountering Jesus in the Scriptures, which is co-sponsored by the Church in the 21st Century Center. Sheila has done a tremendous work in preparation of this event with numerous emails and uh, to get me here. I am extremely grateful to her. I am also very grateful that you all have taken time out to come here tonight and I am looking forward uh, to the discussion with Professor Cahill as well as with all of you. In a world of global empire, exploitation and suffering, religious people are called to work for justice and the well-being of everyone. Hence, theologians have the task to articulate religious faith and vision in such a way that it inspires hope and commitment to the struggle for justice rather than engender prejudice and despair. 
It is therefore crucial that we scrutinize our images and understandings of Jesus as to whether they inculcate prejudice or inspire work toward justice for all. Christians have internalized very diverse images of Jesus. However, we often do not realize that our understandings of Jesus have been produced by elite clergymen's scholarly or dev devotional interpretations and projections of their own understandings of Jesus. Since our understanding of Jesus and our view of the world generally correlate, such understandings of Jesus often serve to inculcate male authority and curiocentric, that is, Lord, Master, Slave Master, Father, elite, male-centered, oriented mindsets. The Jesus rhetoric, which we have assimilated through sermons, Bible study, hymns, literature, pictures, or movies, imbues our images of Jesus with hegemonic cultural and religious values of gender, race, class, and ethnicity. In other words, how we see Jesus bespeaks the values which hegemonic culture considers important. As one of the Jesus scholars, Marcus Borg, observes, I quote, my point is the correlation between images of Jesus and images of the Christian life. Given this correlation, the question is not so much whether images of Jesus ought to have theological significance. At the very uh, practical, immediate level of Christian understanding, devotion, and piety, our choice is to let that significance be largely unrecognized, unconscious, and unchallenged, or to be conscious of institutional, uh, institutions about uh, that relationship. In the following, I will in, in the first steps then discuss the work of scholarly historical reconstruction, and in the second step, elaborate my understanding of Jesus as part of a divine wisdom movement. First then, since we have not simply one, but four very different canonical Gospels, and many more Gospels, if we count those that did not make it into the official canon of the churches, scholars have to piece together the often contradictory information provided by the Gospels in order to reconstruct a historical picture of Jesus' life and work. The present proliferation of books and articles on the historical Jesus proves that at best we can glimpse the historical shadow of Jesus of Nazareth, but how scholars develop his picture will always depend on the lens they use and the kind of constructive model they adopt or the story they tell. This holds true also for the earliest portrayals of Jesus in the canonical and extra-canonical early Christian literature. Any presentation of Jesus, scientific or otherwise, must therefore own that it is an imaginative reconstruction and open up its historical models or narrative uh, patterns to critical inquiry and public scrutiny. Most importantly, the ethic of interpretation requires that such reconstructive models be tested as to whether they reinscribe mindsets of discrimination and exclusion. The imaginative spiritual rough relationship of women to Jesus, the perfect man, reinforces heterosexual self-understandings. The obstinate persistence of the veiled or explicit anti-Judaism in Christian arguments for the liberatory uniqueness of Jesus equally raises two sets of epistemological questions. The first one is historical, the second theological or ideological. 
The first set of questions ask not only what we can know historically about first century Judaism and the relations between Jesus and women, but also how we know what we know, who has produced this knowledge, and to what end it has been produced. The second set of questions ask, what kind of theological interests compel Christian anti-Jewish reconstruction of the Jesus of history, or the presentation of Mary of Magdala as love-stricken rather than as a leading disciple? A, a patterns that determine the popular imagination. In my own work, I have sought to spell out a feminist uh, reconstructive historical model. And uh, don't ask me what I mean by the F word, feminism. <laughs> I, I have a bumper sticker definition of feminism, which means feminism is the radical notion that women are people. <laughs> women are full, uh, fully entitled and responsible citizens. So that's my definition of feminism. Keep it that in mind. In my own work, I have sought to spell out a feminist reconstructive historical model that seeks not only to take into account the questions raised by decades of historical Jesus research, but also to make explicit its own hermeneutical perspective and theological framework, one which seeks to avoid anti-Judaism as well as the reconstruction of the historical Jesus as the great male hero who saves helpless, devoted women. For such reconstructive framework, I have found helpful the feminist recovery of the biblical wisdom traditions. Traditional theology has focused on the spirit, who is in Latin grammatically masculine, whereas feminist theology has rediscovered the divine in female gestalt or form. Jewish feminists have explored the divine figure of Shekinah, who plays a significant part in a Jewish tradition, whereas Christians, especially Catholic feminists, have elaborated the female figure of divine wisdom, which in Greek is called Sophia and in Latin, Sapientia. Several books of the Bible speak about her, some of which, however, are not found at all, or only in an appendix, in Protestant versions of the Bible. Divine wisdom, Sophia, Sapientia, plays also a significant role in Orthodox theology but less so in modern Western Christian theology. Rather than begin with a model of historical reconstruction that assumes women's marginality or absence as historical agents in the movement that carries Jesus' name, a critical feminist historical reconstruct uh, reconstructive model begins with the assumption of women's presence and agency instead of their absence, marginality, and passivity. Such a model shifts the burden of proof to mainstream biblical scholarship that maintains women were not active and present in the development of early Christian life and theology. Only the presumption of the historical and theological agency of women, slaves, freeborn and freeborn, Jewish, Greek, and Roman, rich and poor women, will allow us to read the slippages, ambiguities, gaps, and silences of grammatically masculine text, not simply as properties of language and text, but as the inscribed symptoms of historical struggles. In an androcentric language system, that means a male-centered language system, the masculine is used as generic, and women are mentioned only if they are the exceptions of the rule, if they cause problems, or as signifying figures to think with. Hence, one needs to read such language against the grain, and English is a wonderful language to do so. You can't do it in Spanish or in German. 
In English, women includes men, she includes he, and female includes male. Women always have to think twice when we hear brothers, chairman, or mankind and ask whether or not we are meant. Hence, reading against the grain, I use women as an inclusive term so that men in the audience learn how to think twice <laughs> and how to become sophisticated and to ask whether or not they, meant, they are meant when I speak of women. I recommend this as a good spiritual exercise for the next hundred years or so. <laughs> the passages on women in the Christian Testament are not all the information we have about women. If we are serious that male terms that, such as apostles, teachers, diaconos, or saints are generic terms meaning both men and women. The passages on women are like the tip of an iceberg indicating not only that women were part of the early Christian movements but also uh, indicating the many memories we have lost. Such a change of theoretical framework or hermeneutical lens makes it possible to understand Jesus and early Christian beginnings as shaped by the agency and leadership of Jewish, Greco-Roman, Asian, African, free and slaved, rich and poor, elite and marginal women. Those who hold the opposite view that, for instance, slave women were not active shapers of early Christian life and faith would have to argue their point. <clears throat> if one shifts from a curiatial frame, that is a um, Lord slave master centered frame of reference, to that of the discipleship of equals, one no longer can hold, for instance, that women were not shaping early Christian thought and community. If one cannot show conclusively that women were not active members of the earliest Jewish messianic group that named itself after Jesus, so my argument goes, one needs to give the benefit of doubt to the textual traces suggesting that they certainly were. Rather than to take curiocentric text at face value, one must unravel their politics of meaning. How then uh, can uh, this earliest Jewish women's movement um, named after Jesus be reimagined in terms of wisdom theology? Second then, my second point, section. Undergirding my reconstructive historical model are three additional basic assumptions. First, the hermeneutical practice of anti-Judaism is contrary to a Christian feminist theology of liberation because this historical assumption does not recognize that Jesus and his first followers were Jewish women, women in the inclusive sense. They were not Christian women in our sense of the word. Rather, as Jewish women, they gathered together for common meals, theological reflection, and healing events. They did so because they had a dream and followed a vision of liberation for everyone in Israel, a dream that could have been inspired, been inspired by the vision of the open cosmic house of divine wisdom as it is found in Proverbs 9. I quote, Wisdom has built her house. She has set up her seven pillars. She has mixed her wine. She also has set her table. She has sent out her women messengers to call from the highest places in the town. Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave immaturity and live and walk in the ways of wisdom. The house of divine wisdom has no exclusive walls or boundaries, no fortifications and barricades to separate and shut up the insiders from the outsiders. 
Wisdom imagination engenders a different understanding of Jesus as prophet and messenger of divine wisdom who invites us to her table and not as boss man, as ruling king and as enslaving lord. Second, who Jesus was and what he did can only be glimpsed in the interpretation and the memory of Jesus if the movement of which he was a part is understood as a first century Jewish wisdom movement. A very early saying states, wisdom Sophia is justified by all her children. Uh, the saying which is found in the Logosaurus Q. This saying in Luke 7, 35 understands all of Israel as divine wisdom's children. The saying most likely has its setting in life in the inclusive table community of Jesus with sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes. Some of the earliest gospel tradition uh, therefore see the ministry and mission of Jesus as a work of that of a prophet of divine wisdom and later identify Jesus with divine wisdom. Divine wisdom is the loving God of Jesus of the poor, the outcast, and all those suffering from injustice. It is likely that these early Jesus traditions interpreted the Galilean mission and work of Jesus as that of divine wisdom, because Jesus of Nazareth might have understood himself as a prophet and child of divine Sophia. As wisdom's messenger and prophet, Jesus not only proclaimed the Basilea, that is the common will of God, to the poor, the hungry, and the excluded in Israel, but he also made it experientially available to all in his healing practices. As divine wisdom's messenger, Jesus calls the nobodies who are heavy laden and promises them rest and shalom. The yoke of divine wisdom is not heavy, but light, according to Matthew 11:28. The wisdom God of Jesus recognizes all Israelites as her children. She is justified, made just, in and by all of them. The oracles of which, uh, in which divine wisdom speaks directly imply that the fate of Jesus was that of a, prophet, a prophetic messenger of divine wisdom. I quote, Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send some prophets and apostles. Some of them they will kill and persecute. Luke 11:49. In a similar way, the following statement, which is only found in Matthew and there placed in the mouth of Jesus, must have been originally an invitation by divine wisdom herself. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This prophetic wisdom tradition is an open, ongoing tradition. Jesus of Nazareth, who was understood as an eminent prophet of divine wisdom, does not close this tradition, but activates it. As a child of divine wisdom, Jesus stands in a long succession or unending line of prophets who seek to gather together the children of Israel to their gracious wisdom God. Just as some of the other prophets, both women and men, who have gone before them, so also John the baptizer and Jesus were persecuted and killed as the emissaries of divine wisdom. Third, the emerging variegated predominantly Galilean movement that understood itself as a prophetic movement of divine wisdom was convinced after Jesus' execution by the Romans that he, the one anointed by a woman, is the vindicated or the resurrected one. This conviction had its basis in the women's tradition of the empty tomb, which centers around the proclamation that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. This tradition understands the movement as an ongoing and inclusive movement of prophets and messengers sent to Israel 
and the world by divine wisdom. It is thus best understood as a movement in which Jesus is primus inter pares, or first among equals. The stories of the empty tomb are ambiguous and open-ended. They invite us to cultivate a wisdom spirituality of justice that is inspired rather than threatened by such openness. In the face of the empty tomb, the search for orthodox control and scientific certainty becomes questionable. Instead, the spirituality of the empty tomb valorizes a compassionate practice of honoring those who are unjustly killed in body or spirit. The empty tomb story celebrates women as faithful witnesses who do not relinquish their commitment and solidarity with those who fall victim in the struggle against dehumanizing powers. Most importantly, it affirms that the struggle of Jesus and all struggles for justice have not ended in execution and death. The tomb is empty. The living one is not going away to live in heavenly glory, not leaving us to struggle on our own. The empty tomb does not signify absence, but presence. It announces the presence of divine wisdom's prophet on the road ahead in particular space of struggles, such as Galilee. According to Matthew, Jesus is the living one and the embodiment of divine wisdom. Jesus is present in the little ones, in the surviving struggles of those who are impoverished and hungry, imprisoned, tortured, and killed today. The empty tomb proclaims the living one as present in the faces of our grandmothers who have struggled for survival and dignity, in those of women ministers today who gather the people around the table of divine wisdom. Such an egalitarian reconstructive historical model, I submit, is able to place the beginnings of the prophetic wisdom Jesus movement within a broader historical frame of reference. This frame allows one to trace the tensions and struggles between emancipatory understandings and movements in antiquity, movements that were inspired by the logic of equality on the one hand, and the dominant curiaceous structures of society and uh, religion on the other. Ancient movements of emancipatory struggle against relations of exploitation do not begin with the Jesus movement. Rather, they have a long history in Greek, Roman, Asian, and Jewish cultures. The emancipatory struggles of biblical women must be seen within the wider context of cultural, political, religious struggles. Such an historical model of emancipatory struggle sees Jesus and the movement that kept alive his memory, not over and against Judaism, but over and against the Roman imperial structures of domination in antiquity. In this understanding, Jesus is seen as going ahead of us in the emancipatory struggles for a world of justice, liberation and freedom from silencing and oppression. He is going ahead in women's struggles to mend the world. By focusing not on the historical Jesus as a great male individual and charismatic leader, but rather on the vision and praxis of the movement gathered in his name, this reconstructive model not only aims to make anti-Judaism harder to import into Christian self-understandings, it also seeks to avoid the cultural romantic trap of women's masochistic attachment to Jesus, the all-powerful man. In conclusion then, Christian identity and commitment to justice for all has to be articulated again and again within the emancipatory struggles for divine wisdom's envisioned world that spells well-being and freedom for all without exception. The one God of Jews, Christians, and Muslims today still calls women of faith to engage in the biblical vision of justice well-being, freedom, love, and salvation 
that has inspired countless people in their religious political struggles for a more just world. Just as in the past, divine wisdom has called Jesus of Nazareth, Mary of Magdala, and many unnamed others, so also still today, she calls her women ministers from all corners of the earth to extend her invitation in the struggle, struggles for justice. Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave immaturity and live and walk in the way of wisdom. Let us heed her call. I thank you. I want to thank you again for coming and for giving us a sample of your renowned feminist hermeneutic and your theology. And you've really drawn a great crowd uh, as well. So I also see here more age uh, difference than we usually have at these events. They usually draw older women and not so many uh, younger students. And there are, there's also more of a gender mix here. So it's, it's a really great opportunity and we welcome you and we're you grateful. Use, you use women inclusive. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Okay, so um, I have one observation about um, a point that I think you were making. Uh, to me, it's a very important point. And then a further observation of my own about feminist methodology um, that I think is also what you're saying, but I guess that would be my question. Do you agree? Um, and then a further question for discussion. And I also have a question from Sean Copeland, whom I saw leaving our, the theology department going home because she was ill. And I said, if you had just one thing or one point to make, what would it be? So she gave me one thing. And I don't know that we should expect you to respond to these or whether we just want to open it for discussion. That'll be up to you. So I, I will try to be very concise, as you were, and stay within my time limit, which was 10 minutes. So the first key point is that um, when we look at the biblical narratives, and, and we're trying to draw out of those the, the strands, the authoritative, revelatory, normative strands um, for today, a key point is that both the biblical texts um, and our discernment process today really begin in concrete experiences of salvation as liberation from evil. So there is a communal, experiential, historical basis even to the expression of the biblical narratives. And we see those narratives, that's why we have four gospels and why we have many different epistles written to different communities. So the scriptures really engage us and draw us into a historical communal process of salvation, of faith, of expression, worship, and reflection. Um, in your paper, you expressed this uh, experience of salvation in terms of themes within the New Testament, which also go back to the Hebrew Bible, having to do with the wisdom or Sophia tradition. So that was what was innovative, a way of holding up aspects of what is liberatory, what is saving. And so, um, you know, you say, uh, for example, uh, who Jesus was and what he did uh, can only be glimpsed in the interpretations and memory of Jesus. So that refers to this community, to this living process of salvation that is handed on within history. Um, you say also that sayings, such as we find in, in uh, the Q source or the Gospel of Luke, wisdom, Sophia, is justified by all her children, and that is applied to Jesus. So again, you say that an expression like that of what salvation is had its setting in life in the inclusive table community of Jesus with sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes. So in that experience, um, Jesus is real and alive as the prophet of divine wisdom or the child of divine wisdom, Sophia. Um, and and uh, Jesus makes um, God's common will, which is inclusive of all, experientially available, first of all in his healing practices and then as the risen one experienced within the community. 
So the, the first observation is that the whole foundation of your biblical hermeneutic and theology is very historically grounded and practical. It's not just reading the Bible as a text. Um, so the, the first um, conclusion that I would draw from this has to do with method in feminist theology. And so the conclusion is that for feminist theology, a similar method is appropriate. And I see that as operative in your work. Today in my class, uh, it's a grad class, it was right before this, we were reading in memory of her again, because it's on our comps reading list. And so we were talking about how you um, see scripture as a historical prototype that is interpreted and received within a community of men and women, or women in the language that you're now using. Um, so I think that that's women a... Women with a slash. Yeah, w <laughs> with men, <laughs> with, with a slash in the middle. Um, so the, the, um, the conclusion that I draw from that is that feminist biblical scholarship is held up to the liberating experiences of women today, that those experiences are a criterion. But just to emphasize the further point that the experiences of women today as to what is just and liberating and non-prejudicial and non-oppressive is already informed by the biblical vision, at least within this Christian tradition or, or Jewish in, uh, and Christian tradition of interpretation. And I, I would also want to add to that that we need not or should not see this Christian community as cut off from our membership in other communities from which we also learn other experiences of emancipation and liberation. And I think especially in your comments today, you really lift up as a model for that the fact that Jesus and the early Christians were also interacting with Jewish traditions. And they were Jewish, obviously, to begin with. So you, you see an expansion of the notion of what is the religious community and a, and a certain porousness and flexibility um, that continues even today. Um, so the, the method of feminist hermeneutics um, includes scripture, but it also includes community or the church or the ecclesia of women, um, plus other communities in which we participate. And then the question for discussion, and I would actually love to hear what other people have to say, especially younger women, but women from different experiences. You know, you can see, well, you're German and I'm American, but we're both uh, older, white, academic, middle-class, feminist theologians. So what about the people that come from other religious traditions or in other age groups? What about our undergraduates? What about people who aren't academics but are out, um, you know, living in parishes or trying to seek a spirituality in their own lives? So what does or should the ecclesial practice of women, women and men, look like today for us? Um, and I have a lot of examples of this that I could offer. And the first one is um, just sort of a conception that some older women have in the, or react against in the um, situation I think is changing today. Last year I actually went over to Harvard to give a paper or a short presentation at a conference anyway. But I was uh, introduced by a woman professor from the Harvard Divinity School who said, and here's Lisa Cahill, and she's a feminist theologian, and she teaches at Boston College. It's a Catholic institution. There are some signs of hope in the Catholic institution because we have women who are being ordained as priests, like on the St. Lawrence Free Seaway by renegade bishops and so on. You know. And I just kind of went, um, I, I had this gut feeling that that's not really where it's at today, uh, so to speak, <laughs> and that there's not a big movement among the undergrads. Uh, to seek this sort of thing. And, so, and it really raises the issue, well, and I, I do know undergrads who said that they would like to be ordained as priests, but their solution to it isn't sort of an alternative ordination sort of within an ecclesial structure, but not exactly. And there was actually an article that I just got yesterday in the Journal of Feminist Studies and Religion, of which you're an editor, um, raising questions about this whole women priest thing from the standpoint of younger women. And they're saying, is this just reinscribing patriarchal, kiriarchal, uh, institutional bureaucracies and essentialization of women and so on um, today? So my question there is, 
what are um, the original, the enlivening, the liberating practices that women and men in the church today are finding to nurture their spirituality, to seek liberation, to identify justice, and to carry forward this interpretive community? Um, to give two examples from here at BC, last week I was uh, asked to be on a panel or told about a panel that's examining the white Jesus. Okay, so, it, so the first thing is taking this whole uh, liberation dialogue out beyond sort of traditional middle class academic or whatever white feminism. And I know Elizabeth is very cognizant of that already and so are we all. But just to put that, you know, on the table. That, and so that's something that's really important and that's going forward and it's got to be carried forward by other people than us. Okay, another thing here at BC is the rediscovery by some of our undergrads especially of what we would think of as pre-Vatican II religious practices. I see a heck of a lot of people going around wearing miraculous medals. Okay, my grandmother had one, but I wouldn't wear that. Okay, we have a huge movement here of Eucharistic adoration uh, that a lot of undergraduates are very involved in. It doesn't mean that these undergrads or students are not committed to the equality of women and men or that they're not interested in social justice because oftentimes they are. So it's raising the question of what practices or renewal of practices make sense to different people at different times and how can we expand our horizons. Um, you know, being critical on both sides, of course. I'm, I wouldn't just want to accept everything that undergrads do is necessarily always the right thing to do, but I <laughs> need to learn from them as well. Okay, and then um, the final thing is a question from Sean Copeland, which actually fits right into this. And she pointed out to me that Elizabeth has a new book out, which is called The Power of the Word, Jesus and the Rhetoric of Empire. And so Sean's question was, what is Jesus' critical word to the world? So, you know, where we have started and where we've grounded ourselves is within the Christian community. What is our identity as nourished by the scriptures and is uh, re re retreating and renegotiating the scriptures for today? And Sean was trying to point us even more broadly beyond Christianity, certainly beyond North America, to ask about um, all cultures, all traditions, what is Jesus' word? And I think I would even add to that, how do we bring that word forward? You know, it's one thing to sit within the Christian, Christian community and say, Jesus judges this, 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 and this. But how do you use uh, the rhetoric of Christ to really um, interact with, productively, uh, to change and to bring justice and um, um, transformation, you know, uh, more broadly even than Christianity. So that is my 10 minutes and I'm going to sit down and I'll leave it to Elizabeth whether you'd like to respond or whether Sheila would just like to open it. <laughs>